All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to spend a little more time looking into this model fitting aspect of Bayesian statistics. And this is a bit of a technical subject, but I think it's worth it because one of the advantages of the modern framework for fitting Bayesian models is uh, the amount of tools that we have to check model fit, okay? So sometimes we're working with very simple models in this class, and frequently we're, we're using simulated data that we know exactly the generative process that generated the data. But when we're, you're working with real data, you won't have access to that, right? And it's very common to have, you, you think of a very complicated, very powerful model, and you try to fit it and it doesn't fit correctly, right? And um, in the past, you'd have to sort of rely on your common sense or maybe do some simple model checking. And, and now modern MCMC uh, samplers have very powerful tools to check uh, convergence of the methods to see if you actually landed on a on a stable solution to what to the model that you're trying to fit in terms of the distribution of the parameters. And also, lots of diagnostics that are um, very useful in detecting misspecified models. So sometimes you define a very complicated model and it just doesn't match your data that well. And this leads to computational problems that are now much easier to detect. So I think. And to understand these things, you have to peer into the, the black box that generates the samples a little bit. So I'm going to try to do this today a little bit. It's going to be a little bit technical. I'm going to try to, to show some interesting applications of, of having these posterior samples later. And in the afternoon, we're going to manipulate them in the, in the exercise, and hopefully that will make things uh, easier. OK. Before I start, any lingering questions from yesterday? Yes. No? OK. Uh, I will ask Andrea to put it up right now. Andrea, could you put these slides up? I don't think these are up. Andrea is on it. Uh, OK. So quick recap where we were. Right? Yesterday, we were fitting this weight to height linear regression model. Uh, I showed you that we got a sample from the posterior that appeared magically. And we used this sample to create this sample of the posterior sample of regression lines, which are the gray lines, and to plot the uh, posterior average regression line, which is the red line. Right? So this is our choice of estimator, the mean. And we can use the samples to get an idea for uh, the variation in the uncertainty around this regression line. Okay? We do this using these samples from the posterior. I showed you this yesterday too. This is this posterior has three dimensions, right? There are three parameters. And each sample is therefore a multivariate sample from the posterior. These these travel together. This row here is one sample and you have in this case, 2,000 of these samples to characterize the posterior distribution. Um, but it's important that you realize that one sample corresponds to one of these rows. And th these values are linked to one another, right? You need, the, this is a single sample, okay? Each row of this, row, of this, of this table here. Yes. Just in case, this is the good yeah. one. I don't understand that quite well, because when you showed yesterday, you showed a probability distribution for any of the parameters. Yeah, yeah and I, I, I was showing what, what is called the marginal distributions. OK. So these are kind of slices through the posterior sample. So we're looking at one of these rows, right? But we're looking at one of these dimensions. So you can think about this as having like a three-dimensional 
sample of points, and you're looking in one direction or the other, right? So you're taking these slices. And it has to be defined that way, otherwise no, it doesn't make sense. No, we can do, it, we can do a bivariate to? sample, too. I mean, for plotting, the best we can do is two dimensions, right? We can have a three-dimensional one, but it's much harder to look at on a screen. Uh, but sometimes we will look at the bivariate samples, too, okay? Thanks. Good. But if you're making predictions, you, you have to use these rows, uh, the, the full row at, at, at each of the time, okay? Okay. Okay, how do we get these posterior samples? Well, the, the unfortunate truth is that there is no, like, general method to find high probability regions in probability distributions, right? So it, it, you think about this as having, you have an oracle, right, that will, for each value of the parameter, for each value of the parameter, for example, i here, and when I say this, I mean a vector of parameters, right? So for all the parameters in this model, right? You have a little function that once you plug in this value, it gives you a number. I'm going to call it a constant k here. That's a real number that comes from this thing, right? That's all you have access to. So you have a, a, a computer program that you plug in parameter values, and it spits out a probability density, something proportional to the probability density of this distribution, OK? And this is all you have to work with. So we have to use this little function to find high probability regions somehow. If you have a single parameter, or even two parameters, you can do something called a grid search. Right? You can just test. Just take all of the points in a region that you think is reasonable plug it in here, and you draw a little graph, right? And you might find some region here where the probability peaks and then declines, right? Doing an exhaustive search like this in high dimensional space is unfeasible, right? And so if we have even three parameters, this starts to be difficult. If we have more than three parameters, it, it's it takes too long. It's just impossible to do this exhaustive search. And yeah. Uh, I'll probably say something stupid, but. Go ahead. Uh, if, if we have more than three parameters, does uh, posterior distribution will have more than three dimensions. Yes. So the posterior distributions will have as many dimensions as the number of parameters in your model. And this can be in the thousands very quickly, okay? So it's really important that we have more robust methods to do this. Okay, we call, sometimes call, this is a, a, a classic example of the curse of dimensionality, and I'll try to give you some intuition of why this happens. So I'm, I'm going to use the, the old joke that high-dimensional watermelons are awful. And why is that? The, the physicists in the room are already laughing because this is a common joke, right? Suppose you have, in the middle of this interval here, a high-probability region that you're searching for it, right? In one dimension, you can walk through this and find this region. That's fine, right? And you have, in the borders here, what I'm calling the, the crust of the watermelon, the rind that is not a high probability region and you, you don't, your parameter values, your region of high probability is not here, okay? So th this is easy to find. If you're in two dimensions, then this, the space that you have to search, that you have to find, is now a very small proportion of the space here and finding it becomes harder. In three dimensions, the core is already a very small part of this little cube here. And it's very difficult to find in three dimensions. And this goes on in fourth dimensions and five dimensions. The middle becomes smaller and smaller in comparison to the rind. So if somebody wants to sell you a high dimensional watermelon, 
don't buy it because it's all rind. There's almost nothing to eat. Okay. Is that clear? Okay. Did that help? Okay. There's something else here. It's not just finding uh, high probability regions, right? Because there's a balance between the space and the probability density. And this is a bit subtle. So I'll go slow in this plot here. So I'm trying to describe something called a typical set. This is where a typical sample will come from in probability space. Okay? And I'm, in this figure here, pi is a probability distribution, q is a parameter, and I'm plotting distance from the mode, distance from the highest value in the probability distribution, right? So this is the highest value in the probability distribution, and this pi q here is the probability distribution I want to sample from, right? And imagine that this is a very high dimensional probability distribution. Q is very high dimensional in this case. What happens is dq in this figure are these little squares here, right? It's the little infinitesimal blocks of this parameter space that I'm trying to find high probability regions in. If I take a sample from this probability space, what is the chance that I get a sample some distance from the mode, right? There's a balance from the volume away from the middle being much larger than the middle, just like this. The empty squares here are much larger than the middle square where the mode is in this example, okay? And the fact that the probability is much higher close to the mode. So you have a push and pull happening here. The much larger space away from the mode and the high probability on the mode, okay? And this balance means, so you can see that the dq, the number of squares grows very fast when you move away from the mode, and the probability distributions decay as you move away from the mode. This means that the product of these two has this shape which is not peaked at the high probability region, okay? It's peaked in this intermediary region that we call the typical set, okay? This is where most of your samples are gonna come from because of this trade-off between probability and, and volume, okay? Is this clear to everybody? I'm gonna show some examples, but please ask a question now because this is very complicated. Yes. Just one more time, what is DK? D D DQ? DQ is a measure of the volume in this space away from the mode, okay? So the only square on the mode is this little middle square here, right? And so as you move away from the mode, there are many more squares that are a distance one from this middle than there are squares that are distance zero, right? So at a distance of zero from the mode, I have one square. At a distance two from the mode, I have these eight squares here. And in three dimension, this increases a lot. I, uh, somebody do the product here, I don't know. Okay, so at distance one, we have a very small volume. As we move away from the mode, there are many more squares away from the mode than there are close to the mode. No? Okay. Again. Do you see that in each of these examples, assume that there's a probability distribution in this space here, and there's a mode of the probability distribution here. There's a peak, right? A maximum probability region that is in this black line here, in this black square here, and in this filled in square here, okay? So this is the high probability region. This is represented here by this function, which is the probability distribution for this parameter, okay? There's a peak here, and it decays as you move away from it. And this is distance from the mode, 
okay, so how many units of DQ am I away from this mode, okay? How many squares are, or units of DQ, which is this, these units here, are there in the middle, in the mode? Just one, okay? So there's a very small volume here, and this is represented by this curve that falls off as you come close here, okay? How many squares are there away from the mode? So at a distance one from the mode, and by distance one, I mean this line here, all of these squares, and all of the non-filled in squares in this cube here, okay? How much larger is the volume in the non-filled in squares as you move up in dimension? So in this case, it's two thirds of the volume is away from the mode. In this case, is eight ninths of the volume is away from the node. And in this case, three times three, 27, 26 over 27 squares are away from the mode, okay? So the volume is growing much bigger than the central region, okay? So if I take a sample from this distribution, there's a balance of, I'm sampling a point in this parameter space and there's a high probability region and a low probability region. And, but the low probability region is much, much, much bigger than the high probability region. So even if there's a high probability of me getting a sample in the middle of this parameter space, the sheer volume of the rest of the parameter space is going to dominate the samples. And it's going to dominate in this particular way here where as the probability goes to zero away from the mode, the volume can't keep up. And so there are, there are not gonna be any samples very far away from the mode. There's gonna be very few samples very close to the mode because the volume is too small. It's very rare that I fall there. And there's going to be a typical set, a region where most values of the sample come from that is going to exactly balance the high probability with the high volume in this parameter space. Okay? Good. Let's look at an example in a multivariate Gaussian distribution. So this is a multivariate Gaussian. I'm plotting here two random variables, x and y. Both of them have uh, marginal Gaussian distributions. And they have some joint multivariate Gaussian distribution here plotted in this in space, right? So these are samples from this distribution. So this is the high probability region and this falls off as you move away in both directions, right? So if you move away in this direction, you're still in a high probability region for the Y variable, but you're in a low probability region for the X variable. And so there are no samples here, okay? Yes. Could you just go back a little? Yeah. What, what is that line that just goes up? The line that just goes up is a measure of volume. So this is how much square, how many squares are there away from the mode? And this grows exponentially, right? Because there are many more, as you move away from the middle, like the, the volume keeps growing and growing and growing. Okay, is this clear? Multivariate Gaussian distributions? Okay, I'm gonna show you in the next slide the average distance from one of these points to the mode, to the center of this distribution. And I want you all to predict what you think the distance is going to look like. I want at least two guesses as to what the distance between, as what the shape of the distance distribution, right? Remember, it's, I'm trying to plot uh, the, basically this guy, right? It's how far away most samples are from the middle. It'll be a circle with around two units. It's a distance, so it's unidimensional. So this is the distance to the mode of a 2D normal distribution with mean zero. So the mode is at zero. What is this distribution gonna look like? At least one guess. Where is the peak? A normal distribution, it has to be a half normal, right? 
So guess one. Okay? A normal distribution centered around zero. So this means that most points are very close to the mode, and then we fall away. Yes? Another guess, please. I guess it would look like um, I guess a normal distribution, but not centered on zero. A normal distribution, but not centered on zero. Yes, like the... Something like, like this. No, farther no. to the right. M further to the right? Yes. Okay. W what's the value here? Is it super low, super high? Yeah, medium. Middle end. Okay, so this is guess two. Is that good? Yes. Okay, good. I'm going to show you the plot, right? The distance to the mode of a two-dimensional Gaussian distribution. OK? <laughs> so most of the points are about a distance one here. OK? Why is this happening? There are almost no points that are exactly in the middle. Most points are like around here. And these points have a distance of about one. Yes? Um, when, uh, when Wednesday, we were talking about, we were asking questions uh, in the evening. And we, you talked about something about uh, estimating this with the x and the y. Mm -hmm. Is this that system where we would lose some well, this the is the full, I think we're, I was talking about profiling, right? Yeah. Yeah, we would, we would. We would, if we profile this distributions, we're, we're not going to get these, these multivariate normals here. We're going to get something that's a little bit tighter, right? Because the full distribution, it's at widest in this direction, right? And we, when we do profiling, we take the slices in these directions. Didn't Renato tell you guys about eigenvalues yesterday? Yeah. OK, very quickly. We can also calculate the eigenvalues of these distributions. And the first eigenvalue of this distribution, the eigenvector, will be in this direction. And the eigenvalue uh, will be the variance in this direction. So you can use eigenvectors and eigenvalues to detect directions of high variance in probability distributions, just to, as an aside. OK, so most points are actually at about a distance one. There's almost nobody that is exactly here in the middle, right? Because the middle is very tiny. It's a very small space to hit, right? So you get this. This is the distance from the mean, the mode, of a multivariate normal distribution in two dimensions. Now I'm going to show you what happens when we add more dimensions. I think I made a little animation of this. Is this, is this absolutely clear for everybody? OK, now I'm going to show you what happens to this distribution as I increase the dimensionality of the system. So this is starting with two dimensions and increasing the number of dimensions up until 20. And the distribution keeps moving away, away, away from the mode. The mode stays at 0. But the distribution of distances keeps moving away from the mean as you increase the dimensionality. OK, and the typical set for a 20-dimensional Gaussian distribution is almost never, it's never, honest, it's never at the mode, okay? So the parameter values that you get are all away from the mode, okay? And this is the challenge. The challenge is finding the typical set for the posterior distribution because these are the values of the parameters that you're likely to observe. <laughs> I have a question in my mind, but I'm not sure what the question is. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. would, uh, that wouldn't that mean that for higher um, dimensions, finding the parameters through this method, like it becomes harder and harder, or not? No, well, yes, but that's, mm. that's life, but I guess. Not, not harder, but like more, uh, less precise, no? Because uh, it gets farther from the distribution mean? 
Well, I mean, it, it depends on how much data you have and how well identified this typical set is. Sometimes a typical set is very hard to find, yes. And then you're going to have fitting problems and you're going to have wide posterior distributions, right? So mm -hmm. what does a wide posterior distribution mean, right? It means that you're not sure where the parameter values are, right? There's no, not enough information in your data to localize the parameters, okay? And that's a, a, a diagnostic. We're not, I didn't include, but I should have included in the, in the exercise, right? So wide posterior distributions are uh, a symptom of insufficient data to identify the thing that you want to identify. And just another question, uh, is this always the same for the same dimensions? For, for example, two dimensions is always a mean dis uh, a distribution centered oh, no, on th one? This, this is for normal distributions with unit variance. Oh, okay. So if, if you change the variance, this is going to change the scale here. Okay. And if you change the position, right? Well, the distance from the mean is going to be the same. Yes. Yeah, my, my question was going to be about this. Uh, so you're assuming all the Gaussians that you're I don't know if you're sampling from. Yeah, I'm sampling, sampling from. from but yes. can you say convoluted, or in this case, it's not a convolution? Uh, of pro no, it's it's well. If you can for multivariate Gaussians with no correlations, you can just sample the positions independently. Okay. So this is very simple. But the mean is the same in the all of them. The mean is the same for all of them. If you change the mean, does that behavior change drastically? No, because it's a distance. This is a distance oh, from yeah. it. Okay, of course. So you can you can shift it around wherever you want, and the the, the, the yes. The Um, you, you were talking about mold, yep. right? And then in the graphic, there's a uh, distance from distribution mean. For multivariate Gaussians, it's the same thing. But yes, I should have written mode here. Sorry. Okay, but for, for different... Uh, <laughs> I meant, I, yes, for, for right. asymmetrical distributions with weird tails. For different distributions... Uh, mode would be used, Mode right? is, the, is the most probable one, right? It's the maximum value of the distribution. So yes, I, I should have written mode here. Also something else. This... Okay. These graphs are for higher and higher uh, dimensions. Yes. Um, I guess... Well, I'm still confused about, um, because before in front Yep. Just take the other one. <laughs> Very short questions on the orange microphone. Yeah. We were estimating um, the parameter values, right? And now we're, we're like, estimating the distribution of the parameter values. Which we can then use to estimate the parameters, but yes. Okay. What <laughs> exact, I mean, I can't, I can't uh, bring myself to formulate the question, but that's the distribution of what exactly? Of the distance between typical samples and the mode of the distribution. So this is just, this is not the posterior distribution, right? This is a measure of how far away. Okay, but there I'm not estimating the distribution of the parameters. You're not estimating anything. This is just a, a random it's sample just, okay. from a normal distribution. Okay. Yes. How do you know the mode for this? How do I know the mode for this one? Well, for a for a posterior normal distribution, it's going to be the mean. So in this case, I know it analytically. I could also maximize the posterior to find the mode. Or if I have flat priors, I can use the maximum likelihood estimate, which would be the same thing. So the maximum likelihood is trying to find the mode, okay? But most samples from the distribution are not going to be in the mode. They're going to be some distance from the mode depending on the dimensionality of the parameter space, okay? So what does this mean in, in terms of, yeah? Also, it seems to me like the, the higher 
probability of me finding a value, whatever, is going to distance itself from the actual mode if I have higher dimensions, what yeah. is, I don't know if you're going to talk about it later, but how do I insert this in my, like if for me it's important to, I don't know, I have four dimensions, I want to find the actual mode of something, mm -hmm. but I know that having four dimensions like diminishes my capacity of actually finding the mode? How do I? No, that's, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm, I'm saying. I'm saying that typical okay. sets, like if you take a sample from a high dimensional distribution, most of the samples are not going to be in the mode. That's all I'm saying, okay? It's not making it harder to find the mode. You can find the mode using other methods. But if you take samples from it, if you try to characterize the distribution, you're going to be sampling from this typical set, okay? And the typical set is sort of different from the high probability set. I've been saying high probability until now because you guys didn't know what a typical set was. Now that you know what a typical set is, I'm telling you that the purpose of these samplers is to find the typical set. So, okay, so we want to find when you take a sample from this distribution, most often than not, you're going to find a value in the typical set. So the challenge of our samplers is to find the typical set. That's what we want to do because we don't know where the set is. Remember, we don't, we don't know how to do this sort of sampling for arbitrary uh, probability distributions. I can do this for multivariate normal. That's fine. I can take these samples very easily, but I can't do this to an arbitrary posterior distribution that I defined. All I can do with the posterior distribution that I defined is get the value of that distribution in a particular point. I cannot, using the formula or the definition, ask what is the typical set, okay? I have to have some more complicated method to sample from this distribution. And when I sample from it, I expect to get samples from the typical set. So the challenge is, how do I find the typical set, okay? All of the traditional, like typical probability distributions that you learn in class two of this course, right? They have little R functions in R, right? The R norm, R binome, R x. And this, what these functions do, do is extract samples from that probability distribution. There is no such function for a, a posterior distribution, okay? We cannot easily get samples from the posterior. We have to use more complicated methods, and that's what I'm going into in the next slide, I think. Okay? Any questions? Okay. Okay. So, I, I still used high probability regions here because I think I made this slide before making the typical side set, so sorry. This should be finding typical sets, okay? So this is an illustration of an, a, a hypothetical typical set. And this is not that absurd. If you think about what the, the, the shape of the multivariate normal s typical set looks like, it's a little shell around the mode, right? It's gonna be this three-dimensional little egg around the mode, right? So this is not an, an absurd shape for a typical set. And what I want to do is find a way to sample from it. Okay, I have to find this typical set, okay? And the method we use is called the MCMC method, called the Markov chain Monte Carlo method, okay? A Markov chain is something that has states, right? So I'm gonna call the states X and it has transitions. So you can move from state x to state x plus 1. And importantly, this state only depends on this one. And if we move to state i plus 2, this state only depends on this one. So this is a, 
a single step memory Markov chain. Okay? A Markov chain is this sequence of values such that each value only depends on the previous one for our purposes. You can have longer memory ones. And the Monte Carlo part is that this has some stochastic component to it. So Markov chain is the sequence. Monte Carlo is a reference to the Monte Carlo casinos in Europe. And so there's a randomness element to this. Okay? And our objective then is to have a sequence of samples in this probability space that might start away from the typical set, but somehow makes it to the typical set and then walks around this typical set, sampling it completely. Okay, so that's what we want to happen. Yeah. That, what was, that is what was happening yesterday. That's what was happening in those animations, exactly. We were taking, moving from one state to the other, and that's what those lines were. It was the, the move from one state to the next to sample this typical set. Yes. Uh, at a specific moment, there was a, a ring. Yeah. That was the typical set. That was a typical set, in, exactly. In the middle of that empty space should be the mode. Uh, yeah, sure. You can think about it like that. But was the other examples also typical sets? They the, were, yes. Yeah, OK. Yeah. And no, OK. Keep going. Right. Okay. All right. So I'm going to give you like a laundry list of MCMC samplers just so you know what, what they look like. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about like how this thing works. But the idea is that If we have a posterior distribution, right? So this is defined in terms of our parameters and our data. And we want to find a sequence such that the probability distribution of the sequence is the posterior distribution, OK? And the trick to doing this is defining a smart transition probability. So we have to define a smart transition probability such that given enough time as the time here grows, the probability of the chain converges to the probability distribution. Okay? This is the idea around all of the samplers that I'm going to show you guys, okay? And the, this choice here is, is fairly simple. I'm gonna, I, I will describe it to you. I'm, I'm of two minds of saying this, if it's gonna confuse people more. But the idea is that you make a proposal, so you, you try out a new state in your chain. If the probability given by the posterior, if, So you first have to have a proposal distribution. So this is, I'm going to call it plus one given i. So this is the probability that I land on this guy given that before I was on this guy, OK? So th this is basically what differentiates all the samplers, like how you make a proposal. And now you accept the new state, so your chain moves from state i to the proposal if 
the probability of the posterior probability of the proposal is larger than the posterior probability of the last state, right? So if my probability increases when I move to this new state, I accept it always, okay? Or if probability decreases, is less than so if I'm moving away from the mode I accept with probability proportional to the ratio of the two probabilities that's one Okay, so if the, the reduction in probability is small, if these two guys are similar, I accept with high probability. If the jump in, in if the reduction in probabil posterior probability is too high, then I accept with very low probability. This guarantees that I will sometimes go to low probability regions away from the mode, and this part here makes that the chain wants to move up in probability, right? It's trying to find high probability regions. It's trying to increase the probability of the parameters that it's including in the chain. And sometimes it includes parameters that reduce the probability so that it can move away and sample the tails of the distribution. That's the idea. Okay? Yes. So we are going through a chain of parameters, right? Yes, chain of parameters. Um, our sampler is doing that? Yes, the sampler is doing that. That's the, the method of finding this chain that mm. in the end will converge to the posterior distribution. So. I also have a question. Uh, I also have a question. Yeah. Yeah, kind of, it's related to that. I'm just, I'm going to try to talk what I understood about it. I'm sorry if that's annoying, but. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, because now we have many probability distributions, so it's hard sorry, to keep track yeah. on what's going on. There are a few, on. so recap. Okay. There is the posterior distribution that we're trying to sample from. There is the transition probability, which is this thing here. And there is the proposal probability that is this thing here. So yeah, this is where I'm trying to move to this is whether I accept the move or not. And this is the rule that defines this. So the rule is, if the posterior probability increases with the move, accept it always. Yeah, my point is prior to that. My yeah, yeah, question ahead, is prior. Uh, just so when you say that you want to sample from, the, from a distribution, yeah. you're sampling parameters. Yes. But you want those parameters to make sense because you already have the data. That's why you want exactly. to approximate. Yeah, I'm just trying exactly. to make it into exactly. words. So, <laughs> so I want okay. probabilities that are supported <laughs> yeah. by the I data. Right? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I understand why you also have to accept some probabilities that move away from the, yeah. from the mode. But could you just repeat the last part? Um, so the if is if the my new probability. So so the first line is if I increase my probability, right? Yes. If the probability of the transition increases. Yes. So if the proposal step. has higher posterior probability than the last state. Yes. Then you always accept it. So you accept the transition. Yes. And then if the proposal has a lower probability, I also accept it. You accept with this probability here. Oh. So, you, so there, is, there is a chance of you accepting it. Okay. okay. And the chance is greater the, the smaller the difference between these two. So if this guy is almost as probable as this guy, if this guy is as big as this guy, then you're going to accept it with fairly high probability, let's say 0.9 or something. But, so that, but doesn't yeah. that then make it um, like 
it involves a risk of getting stuck in some areas for because that depends on the proposal right if your proposal moves you far away then no oh it's a oh, okay okay so th this guy doesn't have to be close to this i mean there are some MCMC samplers that will have probabilities of th this proposal probabilities that are close by to the last one, but it can be something else. It can be, and let's make a proposal all the way far away. And what defines my proposal then? Like oh, the, the method, the, the method. So I'm going to show you a bunch of MCMC oh, okay. methods here. Okay. So if you have a, a, a weird exoteric proposal, you have to include it here too, but I'm not going to get into that. Okay. 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 Um, the reason that this works is something called detailed balance, and I'm not going to get into that, but if you, if you Wikipedia detailed balance, you'll get a, a, a notion of why using this proposal makes the chain converge to the probability distribution. Okay? So in the end, what do you get? You get a chain of parameter values that are if you snip out the beginning of it, so right, and this, this start here, you're far away from the typical set. But once you move into the difficult set, your chain converged, okay? And then you're gonna stay in the typical set and sample it. And if you remove these little starting values here, you get something that is uh, proportional to your probability distribution. And you can use these samples to characterize this distribution then, okay? Yes. This all is making sense to me, but it also, I don't know if it's, <laughs> I think it's a little bold of me to say it, but it also feels a little redundant, you know? A little bit what? Redundant. Redundant? N not, <laughs> not exactly redundant, but before we were saying that um, when I sample, I expect to be on my typical set, right? Like yes, but you don't know how to sample from this distribution. I don't know. There what? is no general rule to sample from oh, this okay. distribution. You don't know how to do that. So this is a method for you to sample from this distribution. And this sample, yes, it's going to be the typical set. Yes. But the, the, the trick to doing this is defining this chain of parameters with these transition probabilities. Okay. And this is how you take the sample. There is no other general way. To, I mean, there are other methods, computational ones but most of them are very similar to this. Okay? So in, in very few cases, you get uh, a posterior distribution which you can sample from. So for example, if you have a multivariate normal, very well-behaved posterior distribution, you can sample from it directly. That's fine. But this is rare, okay? It's, it's, it's only a few uh, very particular classes of models that you can do this. While this thing works for any class of model that you have. Okay? Okay. Uh, I'm going to move forward. But just with a laundry list of MCMC samplers. So if you find them in the wild, you know what they are. Okay? So, the yes. Um, it's just it's just a question uh, uh, to to see if I understood correctly yeah. the idea. So we're gonna have a posterior distribution yes. that is gonna come from our data, and then we're gonna use one of these samplers to characterize our distribution because uh, using the idea the concept of um, of posterior distribution alone can be hard to I don't know visualize the I don't know. We don't know we don't know what the typical set is for our distribution. We, d we don't know the shape of it. We don't know where it is in parameter space. All we have is this little oracle that will tell us the value for a particular parameter. But okay. we do not know the parameter values that are high or low probability. Okay, but um, you showed some examples of something that was in two dimensions, right? Yeah. And so I understand uh, how that can be uh, interesting in that case. But when we are going to um, higher dimensions, yeah. even with if even with I if we sample, um, uh, I don't know, even with take samples for our distribution, it's still f hard to see how the distribution is going to be characterized by something that we cannot um, 
characterized usefully by something that we cannot visualize. If it's, high, if it's in high dimension, we cannot, I don't know, have a good visualization of this. Well, yeah, we, you can't see the distribution, but we can do computation with it, right, once we have the samples. Then we can, for example, calculate estimated parameter values by taking the means of the samples. We can calculate predicted uh, uh, values for our data. We can simulate new data. We can look at tail probabilities. So how likely is it that our parameter is greater than zero? You can do all of these things with the sample, right? Okay. That we can't do with just the formula for the distribution. Oh, okay. So okay. having the sample allows you to do all the computation that you want to do. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. I don't know if this is useful, but I think the mo most confusion of these things are coming from terminology. Yeah, like maybe. typical set and the sampling. Because mm -hmm. sampling, maybe people are thinking about sampling data, sampling things that you can. And in this case, we're sampling parameters. Yeah, I guess. So that, that's already a big But this is a very interesting symmetry there, yeah. right? So that's the symmetry between parameters and data that happens in Bayesian probability theory, right? You can sample the data. You also don't know the distribution of the individuals in your population when you go into the field, right? And then you sample them. You pick up a few individuals. You know how to do that, right? You pick up a few individuals, and you measure them, and you get a distribution of the data. Here, we also go into the field, and we measure the parameters. And we characterize our population of parameters using the sample. It's exactly the same. Yes? The field is the data. The field is, no, there's the field of parameters. Let's call it that. Yes, you want to know the distribution of your data, you go into the field and you collect individuals and you look at them and you characterize that population. You want to know your distribution of parameters, you go into the parameter space and you pick up a few parameters and that will characterize the distribution of parameters. Exactly symmetric. Yes. No? Do you agree that you don't have access to the likelihood when you go to the field? To abstract? Uh, yeah. yeah, sure. Right. I guess. But where, where am I getting those parameters from? It's just testing random parameters? Not random, not random. You define the probability, tra you tr define the transition probability. You define an acceptance rate that depends on the posterior distribution. And this structure that you gave to the samples that you're going to take makes the sequence behave exactly like samples from your posterior distribution. Sure, maybe I didn't explain all the way why this works. I can do that. Would you like, guys like me to explain all the way why this works? Show of hands, please. Okay, two, <laughs> three. Maybe I'll do this later then. I'll do it in the exercise section, if that's okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. And it's a lot of math, so I don't know how much it's gonna help. Yes. I, I don't know if it's, it, this is going to help, but I remember once seeing a video that explained Monte Carlo Markov chain, I don't know, MCMC. And then it used an example of hills, you know? So it's like I drop a point, a random point here, and I want to move to another point. And then it, it'll check if this point is higher on the hill or it's lower on the hill, you know, if I'm moving up or down. And you can't and you can interpret these hills as uh, higher probabilities, you know, areas of higher probabilities. So each time I pick another point, which is my proposal, I'm going to check if this new proposal is higher on the hill or lower on the hill. And then if it is higher, I accept it and move to this new point. If it's lower, I check if it's like, it's that condition, so if it's, too distant, then I probably won't accept it. If it's a little lower, then I will accept it. So, you know, it, it, it just like proposes new points and then it'll move up this hill. And it, it also is important to consider this probabilities that I'm moving down from the hill because maybe there is another hill by the side. So if I only accept probabilities that move me up the hill, then I'll never find this other portion of high probability, you know? Yeah. 
That's true, but it's more than that, right? It's not just finding the peaks. You want to sample the tails with low probability. So sometimes you're going to want to go away to low probability regions, but you want to spend most of your time in the high probability regions, right? So it's not just about finding peaks. It's also about characterizing the tails, right? OK. Good? All right. So this, this algorithm that I described here is basically the Metropolis-Hasting algorithm. If you don't have transition probabilities, it's a Metropolis algorithm. If you have the transition probability included here, it's the Metropolis-Hasting algorithm. So that's it. Most methods are some version of this. It's just having more and more complicated transition probabilities that makes them different. Uh, there's also a reversible jump Monte Carlo method that the biologist might have heard before because it shows up a lot in uh, phylogenetic methods. And this is interesting because it allows the posterior distribution to have variable dimensionality. So you can have a varying number of parameters in your posterior and you can sample this weird uh, posterior with, so you have some samples with one dimensionality and some samples with another dimensionality. And this is useful in uh, phylogenetic models because you're looking to count the number of transitions and things like that, right? And so the number of state transitions are variable. You don't know how many transitions there are, so you don't know the dimensions of the posterior distribution before you start. So you will see this method in a few, in a lot of phylogenetic methods. Uh, there are some usable non-Monte Carlo method uh, samplers or model fitters. I will uh, point out R Inla is a very powerful R package for doing Bayesian model fitting that does not use sampling. It uses uh, other approximations of the posterior distribution. Uh, it's much faster in some cases because you don't have to go through with the sampling, uh, but it, it fits a limited class of models. So if you can fit your model in R Inla, I recommend you do so because it's very fast. But it, you have to learn a whole new syntax and the class of models that it fits uh, is not that general, but very useful if you ever run into this. Uh, some more, Gibbs samplers. Okay, Gibbs samplers are probably the most common samplers. Uh, they're mostly surpassed by mo more modern samplers, but they're still widely in use. A lot of the modern use of Bayesian methods was due to these kinds of programs here. The, so this is a bugs, do you remember what the bug stands for? Bayesian updating Gibbs sampler, I don't know. Uh, I know that JAGS is just another Gibbs sampler. <laughs> ah. uh, but these guys were very important uh, in the early 2000s because they, they brought probability, Bayesian probability to the masses, right? You can fit very complicated graphical models in these guys. So the types of models that we were fitting into, up until now could be fit in, in, in wind bugs and JAGS very easily. Uh, they work fine. You guys saw the, one of the examples that I showed yesterday was the Gibbs sampler. The Gibbs sampler, it, it, ha, it, it can sample discrete parameters, which is very cool, but it, it also requires a particular type of prior. So the, the, the classes of distributions that you can use in your prior distributions are somewhat limited. And sometimes you're just stuck with one, and then it doesn't matter if that prior is, is a good description of your of your knowledge state or not, because it's the only one you can use. So uh, sometimes it can be problematic because you're using priors that don't fit with your model structure. But very good still, uh, very general. And then the most modern ones are called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo samples. And what these guys do is uh, define transition probabilities. This is a classic case of making something more complicated so that it's easier. And what they do is they calculate gradients of this function here and simulate trajectories in parameter space. So you, you can think about them as like being in the typical set and like throwing a ball inside the typical set. And then a ball will like loop through it and then you get the proposal from this trajectory. And it's a very physical analogy. It's, it's, it, it looks like a dynamic particle modeler in parameter space. So you have some some velocity given by the curvature of the probability distribution, and then you, you loop around it very quickly. And that was those squiggly lines that in some of the 
this animations that we saw yesterday. These are very fast. Uh, they have one problem with these chains is that sometimes you get autocorrelations between these sequential parameters. So if your proposal distribution is very uh, depend, generates proposals that are very close together, sometimes you get stuck. You, you take a long time to move from one region of the typical space to the other. And so you can have a sequence of parameters that on average are sampling correctly from the posterior distribution, but sequentially they have very little additional information. So you're just sampling the same region over and over again. And this can cause problems because you, you, you need very long chains to, to, to characterize the distribution correctly. And sometimes it's, it's, it's a pain to work on them on the computer. So you, sometimes people will trim them and just take one sample out of every 1,000 so that the, so you're taking samples that are far away from each other and so they are not correlated. And this is wasteful. This is very wasteful, right? Because you're generating 1,000 samples to get one. And these guys, because of this dynamic uh, sort of proposal, they move very far away very quickly. So the autocorrelation is very low. Uh, they can't use discrete parameters in the sampling, so you can't sample discrete parameters, so you have to integrate over them, and that sometimes involves doing a little math in the computer. Uh, they can fit dynamic models using differential equations. So a few of the packages that we're gonna use here, they have differential equations integrators, just like the ones you were using in Renato's class, built in that you can use to define observational models using differential equations. And we're gonna see that in the like, last class or something. Some examples uh, in Python, PyMC3, very powerful. I don't think it has a differential equation solver, but it has a bunch of samplers and it's very fast and very good. If you really like Python, this is a great choice because you write your models in native Python so you can like programmatically generate models, which is cool. Edward is sort of a trippy functional language for fitting models of different classes. Never used it, but people that like doing very conceptual things like it. And the one I like the best is Stan. The Stan is, uh, is one of these Hamiltonian Monte Carlo simulators written in C++, extremely fast. It takes your model code and it generates a C program that will, when run, will sample from the posterior distribution. Extremely efficient, very general, has a bunch of built-in distributions, uh, and it can fit. I've, I've never found a model that I can't fit in Stan. I mean, I, I couldn't do it because I didn't know how to program some of them, so I had to trust other people, but it's extremely general. So if, you, if you're gonna learn one sampler deeply, I recommend Stan because it, it solves a bunch of problems. It has a very active development community, it has great forums to ask questions, uh, and it's overall, I think, one of the fastest one out there. And it's also the engine th in the rethinking package. So the rethinking package that we're gonna see in the afternoon today is using Stan in the background. So it has a simplified uh, model definition syntax, but what it's doing in the background is generating Stan code and using the, the Stan engine to fit the models. So also very good. The rethinking is, is very good to fit like simple models because it's generating good stand code and it's simpler than writing full uh, stand models. But it can get annoying if you have, if you're, once your models get complicated, the rethinking syntax gets too complicated for what it's bringing to the table. There's a lot of tricks. And then just, just, just write the stand code directly, you're gonna have a better time. And we're gonna, we're gonna see some examples today. Okay, what makes these samplers different? It's basically the proposal distribution. So it's how you're getting uh, your next element of the chain proposed. And then the acceptance probability is, is the same for all of them. So they're all doing the same thing. They're just doing the proposals differently. Okay, uh, I think we're moving away from samplers now. So one minute for questions. Nothing? Okay.
Does it make does it make sense to combine different samplers? Um, you could have a, like a mixture of proposal distributions if that is your thing, but I don't. It's uh, a good question. I don't know. You could, because each step can use a different proposal, but I've, I've never seen this done. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I was asking 